it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is off to a great start in your week. Uh, it is a very busy week here uh, at Rick Wallace Enterprises, which includes the Odyssey Project, the Black Voice, the Teachers, uh, <laughs> Master Fitness 21, the Visionetics Institute, the Financial Brain Trust, Legacy Wealth, and on and on and on and on. Uh, wow. Uh, thank you, God. Um, again, I want to thank everybody who has been sending your love, your well wishes, and your prayers. Uh, my sister mentioned this today, and I am so thankful. She is absolutely right. There's this thing where people say that uh, when you have to bury a loved one, normally after the funeral, the calls and the well wishes and the condolences and the check-ins, they, they start to uh, drop in number and frequency rather quickly. And for, I know the, my siblings, when I talk to them, they are still getting, still getting mad love. Um, please forgive the, whatever's going on with the lighting. Uh, I've got all kind of lighting up, uh, ring light, box light, and for whatever reason, the camera's tripping. But anyway, uh, we're getting mad love and support in the loss of our mom and burying our mom. Uh, we're coming up on a month. Uh, it's been three weeks since we put her to rest. Um, and, you know, I'm starting to really come to grips with the fact that, hey, man, this is this is what it is and what that responsibility is for me as her oldest um, and how I have to deal with that. But anyway, again, for those who show love, I want to say thank you. Also, for those who believe in the work we do. We are in the middle of a fundraiser, and we do need your support. Uh, look in the description box. If you have followed me for any time, you know the massive work we've done over the past 30-plus years, uh, the work we continue to do. Uh, we have an upcoming event where we're working with people in the community um, and so much more. Uh, we consistently are pressing forward in research, program development, program implementation, community, community engagement, advocacy, and so much more. Uh, so, again, if you uh, believe in that, definitely show some love, show some support. Uh, if you like what you hear and see, click the like button, click, click the share button. But I got a feeling this is going to be one of those ones where... You're not going to like it. Most most people are going to probably not like it because most people are going to feel some kind of way about what I say. Um, I have been in the field of human development, human behavior now for 30 years. Uh, I have been considered an expert in this field for almost 20. Uh, I have can be considered one of the first and foremost in epigenetics, human behavior, uh, epigenetics and disease on the planet um, and I have put so much of my heart and work into understanding uh, how I could use my skill set, my expertise, my passion, my knowledge and my gifting to be an advocate for my people and so I fight hard to learn, to know, to share, to teach, to develop, to build. And I've been doing it for years and I will continue to do it as long as I have breath in my body. Uh, but in this, despite my own uh, seemingly inability to sustain uh, a romantic relationship, I have done a great deal of studies on people who have uh, to learn what they t tend to do that others don't. And the one thing I can tell you is no matter how good you are, no matter what your intent or no matter how well you're committed to, it takes two. Both people have to be committed. Now, both people don't have to be on the same page, but both people definitely have to be committed. They have to have an understanding of commitment because there will be times their feelings will betray them. Their feelings will forsake them. And that, what, what I mean by that is that there's just going to be times you're going to look at your partner, you're not on the same page, you're not feeling them. There's going to be times you look at them and you're just not liking them. That's the reality of spending each and every day with someone for years on years on years. Nobody's on the same page. Nobody agrees on everything, but there has to be an understanding of how this thing is going to work and project itself into the future. And when you don't have that, 
when you have people doing what we have been trained and conditioned to do in our society, and that is to sink into self and to focus on self and to see what I want, and then it becomes a problem. I told you last week that I was going to do a series on the family, and I am doing it. I'm setting it up. Uh, this is sort of a precursor because you can't start a family without a marriage. And herein lies the problem. We are now not marrying at a record uh, record level. Uh, then we are divorcing at a record level. And we are still procreating and creating children at a record level, meaning that we are putting more and more children in the single parent, parent environments and then expecting them to develop holistically and be uh, pro-social and productive in a society that is inherently hostile towards them. Uh, the number, let me tell you, as a person who has done uh, a huge amount of research in this area, I can tell you that not having your parents in the home with a symmetrical and balanced approach to rearing you has a negative impact no matter how much it shows up i don't care how much money you end up making i don't care how popular or famous you become there's there are going to be things missing there's going to be a lapse in the field and what i try to get people to understand is say for instance everything you judge as 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 a measurement or a standard of success if you hit that and you did it without all of the things that you should have had imagine what you would do if you had them that's the thing you have to look at we get so caught up on measuring against something that we don't realize we're leaving things on the table because we are bigger than the measure and man now this camera is getting on my nerves so i know it's bothering you guys just hang with me look uh so again let's talk about this one of the things that bothers me first is stop listening to these quote unquote relationship gurus men and women find you somebody that has done it even though i've written books on it how many times do you see me up here because Obviously, there's something I need to do, and I'm working on it. And, and I am. I'm working on it because that's something that's at the top of my priority list is having that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a husband by nature, so that's me. But what I do know is how to carry myself as a man. But what I also know is you can carry yourself as a man, and it's still not work. And it still can be two good people. And it's still not work. It can just be a bunch of different things that have to be in line, but it has to be an understanding, number one, when you start the relationship. But let's not even get to that. Let's get to the, the I mean, the, fret, the fledgling stage of the relationship, because there's this thing going on right now. And it is all based around who believes who is the prize when men are dating women and women are dating men, which is absolutely asinine when you think about it number one is male or female if the person you're getting with and talking about spending the rest of your life with you don't see them as a prize as a problem doesn't mean that you're not their prize it simply means that you should see someone who's going to benefit your life in the way that your future uh, husband or wife is going to benefit you they should be considered the prize but we have been trained so much on it it's about me that we don't see that in order for this to work, it's about both of us equally in different ways. And I can tell you that's one of the biggest problems when I'm counseling. That's one of the biggest problems is, number one, here's the thing that I see a lot going on. Ladies, I'm going to start with you first. Men, I'm going to double back on you. Nobody's getting off today. All right, so here we go. Ladies, this whole idea that you have something about yourself that can demand what a man is going to spend on you on the first date is a a sign of entitlement let me explain why what a man a man that's about his paper that can afford to spend two or three hundred dollars on a woman which is this crazy number that everybody's tossing out um and and and, and having been 
blessed financially myself and having been around people who were even more financially blessed than me normally men with money like that don't throw it around unless they are tricking and what that means is the only thing they have is their money so they use their money to get what they can from women men who are confident in themselves men who understand that thing will ball every now and then but what we're what we're doing especially after we settle down and mature and we're really talking about selling we're looking for the person that we can spend the rest of our lives with. A sense of entitlement doesn't work well in an in, in, in an environment where we're both supposed to be doing something. In other words, you're not just entitled to what I'm going to do. Say I am the sole provider. I'm doing everything. You don't have to worry about anything financially. You don't get that just because you're cute. You don't get that because you're putting it down in the bedroom. That stuff, that comes a dimes a dozen. You're doing it because you're bringing me peace. You're doing it because there's something in you that elevates my desire to be better. There's something in you, in the way you handle me, in the way you move, in the environment, the way you keep the house. And I'm not talking about just in cleaning it because I prefer a cleaner, me personally. But, you know, it depends on where we're at and what we're building. But when I say keep a house, I mean... The management of the house, emotionally, spiritually, uh, everything is, is where it should be. And it's a peaceful environment, not just for me, but for everybody in it. And then I solidify that by providing the security. But you got to give me something to secure. You got to give me something of value to secure. So the first date, that's why I don't like dating, because this is the bull crap you do. The first date isn't about me showing you how much I can spend on you. You should be able to observe what I'm doing and the way I handle myself and kind of know my capacity and my capability because I agree, a woman needs to know that a man has the capacity to take care of her. Actually, the way that I train my daughters, if a guy takes you out, unless a guy is independently wealthy, he takes you out on a $300 date, he's a bad manager of money because the $300 meal isn't too much better than the $70 meal. Now, there's a different experience. I get it. The ambiance is different. The service is definitely different. And the environment and the crowd is different. I get it. There's all these different things. But there's a place and time for that. See, that's a the, the $200 meal should be a power move. Not a date. It should be a power move. You out with him and he's out with a business acquaintance or a potential partner or a potential investor. That's when that play should be made. Not in trying to impress you on the first date. I need to get to know you enough to know if it's worth going that deep. I'm not diminishing you by saying, hey, let's go here. I'm saying I would rather sit in a space where there are no thing. Because see, the moment I take you to whatever this place is that you need to go to that's going to... Uh, require me to spend three hundred dollars if i'm gonna take you to that place you're caught up in that you're not caught up in what i'm what i'm about and i'm too busy trying to make sure you're enjoying all of this and then i'm taking it in and all this and now it's about the thing it's about the thing it's about the event it's about the space so now the relationship isn't about me and you the relationship is about what i can do for you but I haven't learned what you can do for me yet. And if you haven't understood, there's got to be a fair exchange in this or it won't work. And what men are learning, and that's why marriage is going down, is because uh, affluent black men are starting to refuse to get married. Why? Number one is we, we get ran up and down about not being willing to commit, but when we commit, we in. We in for good. We don't jump. We, we, now, I'm not saying men don't cheat, and I'm not condoning cheating. I'm not a cheater. Okay. What I am saying is 89% of, somewhere 87, 89% of divorces are filed for by what? Women. So that means that women come into the relationship, they come in, and they tend to leave with more than they came in with. That's statistically speaking. I don't care what you feel. I'm not interested in your particular specific situation because there's always exception to the rule but statistically a woman tends to walk away with more that's why the whole prenup thing is there in the first place now again there are the people like the guy that got sherry shepherd the guy that got mary j and some others that it flipped the other side but that's not the norm the norm is the man is the provider the man is the person that has the more resources and they tend to lose 
when the marriage ends. And so now men are sitting up saying don't have to. And now men are understanding I can play the money game. I can play I got it game and just temple and tapple all over the freaking place. Never really truly commit to anything, but not lose a whole lot. And so that's what we're getting. You can't build with that, though. You can't build with that. You can't build with not having a stable and solid environment where there's both masculine and feminine energy. Now, this idea, and again, I'm not saying that a woman should feel like, shouldn't feel like a man needs to take care of her, but what we are missing in this sense of entitlement is, and women get so mad when they hear, what are you bringing to the table? As if just saying I'm a woman demands everything in that. If, if, if I'm bringing something to the table, God damn it, you need to bring something to the table too. Now, it doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't. It, 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 I, I, what, what I want, now, I'm not going to tell whoever my future mate spouse is. I'm not going to tell you that you can't do you as far as working. Be you, and I'm going to help you be you. I'm going to pour into you, and that's proven with me. I pour into my mate to make sure what they're trying to do, they have as much of the resources that I can facilitate as possible. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm what, what what I want is, you know, if she's bringing something to the table in that area, that's fine. But what I want is to to have someone that can provide a level of softness when I come home from war. And I don't mean in the traditional sense of waiting on me. I can fix my own damn food if I have to. I can cook, and I like to cook. So that's not what I'm, I'm talking about. Your presence welcomes me. Your smile, your eyes, the way you lean into me. But I also want a woman that is okay with being cared for and taken care of. We got so many people that have been doing it for so long, so many women that's been doing it for so long. When you start to cover them, they don't know what that is. They don't know how that's supposed to be. They, they feel like you're smothering them. No, I'm, by, I'm providing you with a protection that you should always have. You should leave from under the covering of your father and walk, into the, walk into, underneath the covering of your husband. You should never be uncovered. You're not supposed to be out there doing all that black girl magic, strong woman stuff. Now, again, you're strong just in the sense of who you are. So I have nothing against strong black women. I have something against how strong black women are presented, portrayed, and uh, defined. To me, every time I hear strong black woman, what goes through my mind is here comes a woman who's doing way more than she should. Here comes a woman who is probably a single mom, probably working multiple jobs, or probably carrying a whole bunch of financial burden emotionally and and actually uh, in a tangible sense, uh, probably putting way more time in with the kids than she would normally do if there was a husband in the place. She's also bearing the uh, responsibility of headship, which technically, whether women want to admit it or not, emotionally and spiritually and physically and uh, neurologically not equipped to do. It's a man thing. The way we process stuff that drives you crazy because you think we don't care because we not tripping like you're tripping is the very thing that gives us what we need to be what we need to be as the head. Non-emotional, rational reasoning and, and, and ability to make decisions. The more you sink into that, the more you lose yourself and your feminine side, which your children need in order to feel that first stage some, up until seven years old of being nurtured. Uh, it's so much that goes into this that I'm not going to get into now, but over the series, we're going to get into it. Now, that's that's just what I'm going to deal with now, because that's what I just saw. This constant push, like, I automatically, just for me saying yes to go on a date with you, deserve you to spend $300. Now, if a dude says, like, and a dude might, he might walk up and go, oh, my God this unbelievably gorgeous black beautiful woman i want to take you on a date take you on a helicopter ride to, and woo and all and everything and that's his way of saying i'm all in and he's going for it and i ain't i ain't saying that that do do that if that's you but the other dude who may be just as good of a spouse in your future may say look hey let's meet at the park 
Let's go for a walk in the park. Let's go for a hike. Let's do this. It may be some things that he's into that he may want you to try to see how you respond to it. You might say, let's let's go to the rock climbing wall. Let's. I mean, and the truth of the matter is, it's not about the money spent. It's about the experience. And so my whole thing is... It's funny. I just thought of something. I'm not going to share it. And I'm going to share it later. But <laughs> but I found that the floss date, the date where you go all out, normally that doesn't ever go anywhere. And the crazy thing is all the chicks I hear talking about it are chicks without dudes. So you're getting the date, but you're not getting the mate. Why? When I think about it almost all the time, the, purpose, the person that's got a woman that's more into them than they are about where they're about to go tends to have a better chance of actually creating a relationship with that person. And I get it. My thing is you want somebody to take care of you, but we have to do this in a state of reality. Number one, we're asking a whole lot of men who have a, a, a median earning, uh, annual earning of 40, 44000 a year. Now, we've got some earners up there, but all these people presenting themselves, let me tell you what, what, what the reality of it is. According to the workforce, according to the IRS, according to the research that I've done, only about 6 to 7% of black men make over uh, six figures. Make six figures or over. So all this bawling that everybody's doing it means they're mismanaging money because if you're not making over six figures you don't need to be balling and spending three hundred dollars every damn week what you should be doing is investing that in uh compound growth mechanisms uh like uh passively managed mutual funds like an index fund that's what you should be doing you should be sitting up and learning how to make that thing make money so at some point none of this is a, a, a all this becomes a moot, moot, moot point a moot discussion okay now men flip side Hope y'all didn't think y'all were getting off. This whole submissive thing. First and foremost, foremost, as a dude, as a man, let me tell you, I understand that there's a need for peace. There's a need for respect. Ladies, please understand this. I don't care how beautiful you are. I don't care how many figures you got in your bank account. If we perceive disrespect, it's going to be problems in the relationship. Your job isn't to handle me. Your job is to sink into me. If you trust me so that I can cover you, so that I can be a leader in our home, so that I can be a head in our home. My job is to always do what you want me to do. My job is to always do what's best for the family. Now, when I make a mistake, it's my job to own up to that mistake and fix what I messed up. But you can't control me. You can't manipulate me. You can't argue me into submission. You can't insult me into submission. You can't manipulate me mentally and emotionally into submission. You will make me so miserable that I will leave, cheat, do whatever else, and destroy the relationship. Either you got to find, here's the thing. See, what happens when you have to really look at it at that deep, you got to actually find somebody you love enough to sink into you after actually men have found somebody you're willing to sacrifice and cover and put before yourself. Guess what happens? You stop jumping into these casual ass encounters all the time, creating all of this mess, these fractured emotions that we say we don't have because it's no strings attached. But I'm telling you, as a psychological uh, expert and a behavior expert and knowing how this stuff works neuro, from a neurobiological perspective every time you meet somebody whether it's at the coffee shop or the bedroom you're making a closer connection with them you can say no strings attached and they may say that's fine you may say it's fine but every time you meet you're meeting for a reason. There's something drawing you to that person. And every time you meet, you exchange a little bit of yourselves with that person. And you become intermingled with them spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and even in DNA. And what happens? When you break up, they take a piece of you with them. You take a piece of them. Now you're carrying a piece of them to the next person. And you wonder why so many different uh, mental 
uh, diagnoses are skyrocketing. There are spiritual elements and components that we're not giving any credence to, but are absolutely measurable. Literally with tools that we have in laboratories, we can measure what's happening in these transactions. But man, this whole submissive thing, submission isn't a forced encounter. Submission is a natural response to your true masculinity. You can't demand it from a woman. You have to earn it. You don't get to show up and say, because I'm a man, you got to submit. Just like she doesn't get to show up and say, because I'm a woman, you got to buy me a $300 meal. What you have to do is be able to say, this is who I am. This is where I'm going. This is how I'm going to get there. I may get there quicker than I expect. I may get there later than I expect, but I'm going to get there. And then you've got to show her that she can depend on you to get where you're going because she needs to know where you're going because that's where she's going to end up because you're taking her with you. Now, when you can convince her that you've got a best interest at heart and she doesn't have to be defensive against you. See, if she's got to defend against your... Um, uh, philandering, if she's got to defend herself against your verbal violence, if she's got to defend herself against your uh, constant flirting and, 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 and everything else that you do that uh, dishonors her, if she's got to be afraid for her own personal physical safety around you, then she can't be submissive because she's in a defensive position. <laughs> See, in order for a woman to submit, she's got to be complete and totally believing that you'll never allow anything negative to happen to her. That every day you wake up thinking of ways to make sure she's okay. And that's your responsibility. We have become so damn selfish that the only thing we think about is ourselves. That we have become so selfish that the number one reason for leaving marriages now is no longer money. It's I'm not happy. So what happens is the moment that things aren't good, we are not happy. We get to acting out like kids and then we sit up and cause more problems. And it's just simply more easy nowadays to sit up and say, I'll move on to the next one. Not realizing the fractures that we are creating and what is supposed to be a cohesive and smooth connectivity and unity in our collective. We are fracturing the home. If the home is fractured, there's no damn way that the community can be unified and in harmony because we are at odds. And it's not by accident. It is engineered. It is being pushed. And we are biting on it hook, line, and sinker. You don't force a woman to submit, bruh. You sit down and you become the man. And here's the thing. Not every woman is in a position in her life to submit. That means she's not for you. You can't walk up and say because she flashy, she a nine or a 10 or whatever, and you looking at them and going, I got to have it. This the one. Now she's not acting the way you want. Number one. Nowadays, let me tell you how it's running. This is how it's running. If she's a nine or 10 and she's under 40, and in some instances, you got to say under 60 because it's some in there in their 50s doing this Instagram stuff, they getting all the attention they can handle and more. I see it. I literally see it. I observe it on a micro level. I observe it on a macro level. I observe it in the studies I do in data gathering. Let me tell you, what you have is a situation where women have discovered the, how to monetize their looks. And they are equating the monetization of their looks or the commodification of their beauty with their worth in a relationship. And they are not the same. They are mutually exclusive. Just because somebody will pay you to put on a swimsuit or walk around in your panties on Instagram doesn't mean a guy wants to spend his whole life with you and is willing to spend his hard-earned money to court you. Because that's what it is. It's courting. Now, I would much rather see a guy say, look, for every date we have, I'm going to build a diary. I'm going to put and invest money into an account that's going to be a trust 
for what we are going to need as a family. So for every day that every date we have, every time we encounter each other, I'm going to make an investment in this trust. What does that mean? With the moment we become 100% sure that we're going to have it, we're going to have something of a foundation to stand on to start a real true marriage, family, and outward. That's what he should be doing. But no, let's go get $300 to stake 48 and 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 feel and in racks messing and all that and yes i'm being very sarcastic right now and i think nothing wrong with going to those places please don't go around saying i'm ditching no man every now and then you need to enjoy yourself every now and then you need to go and enjoy yourself but the truth of the matter is it isn't that much more better prepared because a chef prepared it the nutrients and all that other stuff you can get in a meal you can uh, prepare yourself but the experience is priceless most of the time and i get it here's the problem are you enriching them more than you're enriching yourself i have a formula on how i move i have a formula on how i move because i don't buy something doesn't mean i don't have the money to buy it it means that the equation is hasn't been met yet for me to buy it there has to be a level of significance and priority in what it can produce for me if it's something that depreciates in value there's a very unlikely chance i'm going to get it unless it's extremely cheap and it's just something that i can see some some kind of way it's going to be worth more to me than i'm paying for it if it's not worth more to me than what i'm paying for it, i'm not getting it so that here's the thing it will have to be someone that just totally blew me away to take them on a, on, on a date to a place where I'm going to spend $300 on a meal. Now, the crazy thing is, I may be able to take them, I may decide to take them somewhere else where where we're going. I might spend more than $300. But on a meal, to me, I literally process everything. That's an experience. That's not a meal. We're just eating at this experience. So the experience has to mean something to me. And here's the thing. I'm not saying that it can't happen because it has. But what I'm saying is I could easily see me making that date week or something for my wife. Somebody I'm 100 percent vested in that. This is the person that I'm pouring into. I need her to be her best self. I need her to know she's loved. I need her to know she's cared for. I want to spoil her. You got to be around me long enough for me to know that I want to spoil you, that I want to pour out myself and be uh an asset to you. I, I need to know that. But guys, you've got to be more than just that bag. Because the bag alone won't make them submit. They'll come get the bag, help you spend it, and still give you the business. And, and then you upset talking about uh, they won't let me. Let me tell you something. Oh, no woman in this world has the power to stop you from being a man. Now you can surrender that power to her in order to satiate or to satisfy whatever it is she's driving for or needing from you and you give it, but she can't take your manhood. Now she, she can in ways emasculate your efforts but she can't emasculate you. When I, what I mean by emasculate your effort, you're going there, you're trying to raise the kids a certain way. She goes in behind you and she undermines you because you tell them not to and she goes and she does it. And you just told them no, but she gets it for them anyway. She's undermining you. She's emasculating your force, your power, your authority. But what you can do is sit up and say, okay, you, you do that again. It's going to be a problem all the way to the point of divorce. And then I'll file for custody of my kids and I'll raise them at least when I have them the way that I want to. I can't stop you from doing what you're doing. But I'm not going to be in a house that I'm providing for, a house that I'm sitting up busting my ass for and have you undermining me. But it can't happen. But here's the thing. Every time that you sit up and whine about what a woman is doing, what a woman ain't doing, it's a, sense of, it's, it's a sign of helplessness. Nobody complains about something that can change. So when you sit up and you go, oh, I can't do this because I can't do this. What you're sitting up and saying is I can't. I feel helpless, so I'm going to whine and complain and throw a tantrum. No, get up, do what you're supposed to do. If you've got the right person, I promise you, 
If you've got the right person and you're covering her and you're making her feel safe and you're giving her everything she needs, not just in money. Let me tell you something. A man is a protector before he is a provider. It's one of the things we teach our boys in Black Man Lead in our Rite of Passage Initiative is that at a certain point in time, you're going to start going through what we call puberty. In puberty, you're going to start to produce testosterone at an immensely, at immensely uh, higher level than a woman. If women do produce testosterone just like we are capable of producing estrogen, but we produce it at a much larger uh, fashion. So we're going to become bigger. We're going to become stronger. Our voices are going to get different. I mean, become deeper. And guess what? All that is for, even with the voice. You know why your voice gets deeper? A deeper voice is more intimidating. What does that mean? That means many times I can sit up and protect my family without ever having to result to violence just through speaking. That is a force. Watch a child who doesn't even know the difference and the science can't t Watch the child and the difference when the mother is fussing and when dad walks in and says one word. Mom is giving them the business and they're not listening. Dad going, what's the problem? Kid shuts down. Dad doesn't even spank. That voice has authority. So we teach them that. But we also teach them that this strength that you have, this, this girl that you grew up with the same age as you, that was once an equal to you physically, is no longer an equal to you. You are completely phys physically more superior than she is. But your physical superiority isn't meant to dominate her. It's meant to protect her. So, so with, and this is happening at what? Between the ages of 11 and 13 and 14. So at that time, you are physically able to defend her before you are mentally, emotionally, and skill-wise prepared to provide for her. So your first responsibility as a man is what? To protect. So that's the first thing. You cannot protect someone you are terrorizing. You cannot protect someone that you are leaving exposed. You cannot protect some. And we are leaving our women exposed in a bunch of different ways. Anytime we're co-signing our women going out and exposing themselves in ways that draws attention, is leaving them exposed. We're supposed to cover them. And I'm not trying to take women back to the dark ages. What I'm saying is there's a level of honor in how you present yourself, how you represent yourself, and the attention you draw to yourself. Because here's the thing. As a man and defending you, the last thing I need is to have to fight every night you go out because of the things you do that draw attention to you, that bring the wrong element. You have a responsibility to me to keep me out of those type of situations. And that comes directly with the way you carry yourself, not just when we're together, but also when we're not, because there will be times you will be out by yourself and you'll have people observe you. You need to be carrying yourself in a way that is reflective of the person you're representing. And I must do the same thing. My conversations with women have to be the same they will be if my wife was present. And I can say that from the moment that I asked Marion to marry me to the point that we were divorced, there was never a conversation with a woman that was outside the boundaries of what Marion couldn't listen to. And that is important. Uh, am I trying to paint myself as this perfect person? No, I'm not. But there is a level of honor that comes with the way you love your woman. And I have done everything in my power to be that person. Um, and that's what we have to be. And I don't demand perfection, though. So I don't have a problem with my imperfection because I don't. I'm not looking for the perfect mate. I'm looking for a mate that can put up with me. And I'm saying that in a, you know, comedic or joking, uh, facetious way. But, you know, that's it. It's the idea. What can I tolerate? For the next 30 years. You know, I'm 56, 86, 90. I'm, I'm pushing to hit 90. Then it, it'll be negotiable after that. Me and God said I have a talk. But my goal is to get to 90. So let's say, uh, what, 34 years. In the next 34 years, what can I put up with? If she doesn't change, if she, this is who she is, as she is, without trying to make her be something she not, can I deal with it? Does it diminish me? being with her and most importantly in all of this am I adding to her because I don't want to take away from her so that I can be big because that's not what we do as men we step back the very nature of headship isn't to be at the top it's to be the foundation nothing can be laid without the head and nothing can be laid without the foundation we're not on top we're the foundation everything rises from us and we have to understand that. So it, we're not out in front first. We're not the ones who are sitting around 
and everything, every word that comes out has to be some mention of us. We are confident in who we are. Our work speaks for us. The way our house is run speaks of us. The confidence that our woman has speaks for us. Uh, the Bible says that the, the, the glory of a woman is a hair. The glory of man is a woman. Uh, I remember talking to a pastor, man, 90s, and it was about another preacher who had just came into town, and I was asking uh, what he thought about it. And he said, I can't tell you completely because I haven't met his wife yet. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you can judge the character of a man by the countenance of his wife. Look at her face. She's going to tell you what kind of man he is. Is she always full of anxiety, stress? Do you see worry wrinkles? Or do you see her glowing? Especially when his name is mentioned that he's not there. Watch the face. And I promise you, the countenance of a woman is a reflection of the man that she is with. And so that's what we are striving for is to have our woman go out and people look and say, man, he must be treating her right. Not because of the red bottoms, not because of the bands, not because of uh, the, the, the LV or the Gucci bag, not because of the $15,000, $25,000, dollars wedding ring because of the confidence of her gait, because of the beauty and the glow in her smile, because of the sparkle in her eyes, she is reflecting that she's being loved correctly. Now women, you can't manipulate a man into this. Now you can lure him into it. What do I mean by that? Be his peace. Stop trying to tell him what he's not and start to discover who he is. Because if you're really truly a black woman in this world, expect a million dollar play from guys that are barely making 50,000 instead of saying, I'm looking for somebody I can build with. Because here's the problem. We're training our best to be bums. What are you saying, Doc? We're training our best to be bums. What I mean by that is men tend to flow with options. So what we're learning as men nowadays is that if I got the bag, I don't really have to do jack. So I got the bag. I'm working my butt off in that sense. I'm getting paper. But the rest of me is a bum. I'm emotionally a bum. I'm spiritually a bum. I, 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 I don't, I'm not complimenting you because I don't have to. I got the bag. I'm paying the bills. Just be happy you got this life. You know how many times I hear dudes talking like that? You know why? Ladies, you made them that way when you told them all they had to do was pay the bills. You missed everything else that they bring to the table that's of value. Because here's the thing. If a man really loves you, you won't have to beg him to pay the bills. Now, he may struggle getting it done until he finds himself, but I guarantee you, here's what you do. Here's what you do. You see him, look at his character. Now, character don't pay bills, but look at his character. Does his character tell you he wakes up every day and he goes to work? Because here's what I tell you, God planted a gift inside of every last one of us. And the book of Proverbs says that your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. What does it mean? It means that your gifting is there to expand your territory, expand your reach, expand your, your impact, to create a space for you to ensure that as a man, you're capable of doing what you were designed to do as a man. But here's the problem. We're in a world that squeezes us in the boxes that ensure we never rise to our full potential. And if we're not at our full potential, we can not fully perform our duties and if we can't fully perform our duties we will be dismissed and disrespected by our women it's simply uh the order of nature so what happens it's our job to step out now ladies this is what i'm telling you if he has drive and will if he has a desire and he truly loves you he'll find a way your job is to support him in his growth keep him from settling 
for waking up every day and just saying, I'm going to work. I'm going to kill myself trying to give you what you want and saying there's something inside of you that can earn three times, four times, five times more than you're earning now. And you won't have to kill yourself to do it. You were literally designed to do it. That's the thing. And the beauty of it, men, see the beauty in this woman beyond what her body is presenting because inside of her is a spiritual womb that when you nurture it will birth the very vision that you've been holding inside of you. God designed her to do that and we've been missing on it because we keep buying into this BS that's constantly spit across internet about getting, getting, taking, taking, getting, getting and we're missing the point that we're supposed to be sinking into one another, bonding and growing and expanding. And all we want to do is talk about what they not doing. And I'm talking about both sides. What the, the men do this and black women do this. Let me tell you something. Yeah, we done all screwed up. We all got culpability in this. But as long as the fingers are pointing, nothing's getting fixed. What I can tell you is, instead of worrying about what a man spends on the first date, Find out who he is by observing him and getting into what he does and how he reacts to you, how he handles you. I mean, from every little thing, how he handles you on the first date versus how much money he spends. As far as, far as you, black man sitting up trying to make a woman to submit to something that she doesn't feel safe with, not going to work. You, you, you're, you, you, you are physically strong, but your job isn't to move her. Your job isn't to make her. Your job is to secure her. So, I mean, and the thing is, again, nothing wrong with a nice dinner. But this, I demand this on the first date thing, I don't know you. And whether you think it's the way things should go or not, I don't know you. Men genuinely don't think about that unless they aren't sure who they are and they ident they use their they only identify mm -hmm. with how much money that. Their whole confidence is built on their money. You take their money away and their tricks pitiful and poor. Versus somebody like me, I don't care what I got in the bank. I'm me. 100% of the time my confidence level never drops because the person who made the money is me. Sometimes it's up there, sometimes it's down there, but me made it. Me wrote the vision for what I've done with Rick Flowers Enterprise. Me. So I'm always going to be me. So I'm not going to have to go in my pocket to show you what I, you know, that I deserve your time. I, I want you to get into my mind because my mind is the thing that's going to be there when the wrinkles in the crow's feet really set in. I've been good at avoiding it for the most part. See a little something here and there. But eventually all that's going to set in. I'm trying to keep gravity uh, from taking over. So I hit the gym. And so that's getting squared away uh, after a few years of being unhealthy, which was completely out of character for me. But back, getting back and hitting the gym regularly. But eventually it's still testosterone levels are just going to simply decline. I'm, that, that happens with us. So then what? I work to keep my mind sharp. That means there's always something great going to happen. That that's me. Now, everybody is going to move from a different place, but learn to see that because that's what's going to be there 10 years from now. A lot of us fall in love with things that cannot be sustained. And then you look up five years from now, and you're talking about what are you breaking up for? I'm not happy. Happiness is an internal reality created from within. Nobody else can make you happy. One of the most unrealistic and unfair things you can do is ask someone else to make you happy. It's unfair, and we need to stop. Look, I'm going to get ready to get off of here. I went probably 20 minutes over what I was really planning on doing, 
uh, but I wanted to kind of get on this and we're going to get more detailed and more organized in this discussion of the black family and the importance of it. But this is at the beginning. We can't get past this. It's going to be hard to build a family when we can't even get past creating the initial relationship that leads to the marriage. And if you're not dating for marriage, you are really destroying yourself and you don't know it. Uh, no matter how much you talk yourself into believing and saying, I'm okay with this. I don't need this. I'm good with this. The truth of the matter is you weren't designed for that. Now, there's always these exceptions and there's always these things because everybody talks about what if, you know, the, the, the differential in numbers and availability and all this stuff. My, my point is we are social creatures. Statistics and history and uh, sociology tell me that children are better and more functional as adults when reared in two-parent households. It doesn't care if they're reared in two-parent households in poverty versus a single parent household and wealth. Now, the child with the wealth is obviously going to have a whole lot more things. And guess what they're going to sit up and place value in? Things. They're never going to discover the true nature of their power and their strength and who they are because they are immersed in things. We've got to get outside of the things. We've got to get inside of who we are. But we've got to learn how to engage each other, respect each other, love on each other. And my thing is, everybody's the prize when they're at their best. Yeah, when I when I meet whoever it is is going to be Miss Wallace. She's the prize. But if I don't think she thinks I'm the prize, we're not going to ever get anywhere any further than it could be. Because I'm important and I'm special too. And that's the way it's supposed to be. This, you know, it's the whole idea of only one side being a prize tips the scale, creates a disadvantage, and never brings balance to the relationship. I'm supposed to look at my mate as the prize. My mate's supposed to look at me as the prize. There's equal value in both sides coming into the relationship, or it's not really truly a relationship. It's a hustle. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here again. If you believe in the work we're doing at the Odyssey Project, I'm going to challenge you to step up and look in the description box and give and support click that like button click that subscribe button uh click that share button uh once again thanks guys you have a great day yeah, yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like that just ain't good enough hello everybody dr rick wallace here dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.